Hi everybody, this is the recap video of week three, Carbohydrates and Health. And so far we've been very happy with your participation. Uh, many of you have watched the videos or participating on the discussion forums. We feel that uh, you're learning a lot and that's of course what this, uh, this course is all about. Now we also have uh, a lot of interest in, in certain topics and some questions were raised on the discussion forum that I will uh, try to address in this video uh, today. Um, perhaps you've seen the setting, we're in a restaurant, I'm having dinner with my uh, imaginary girlfriend, uh, she's very pretty. Um, I ordered a surprise menu, uh, I don't know what that's going to be, I'm, I'm very curious. Oh, the waiter, there he is. Um, ah, nice. Uh, okay, I got some apples, some carrots. The apple doesn't look too appetizing. Um, all right, I'm looking uh, forward to that meal. Um, a lot of you commented on, uh, on my dietary habits uh, last week. Uh, I, I presented my, my diet uh, as part of the uh, personal food quest. And I indicated that I eat quite a lot of bread, there was a lot of starch, a lot of dairy products, um, no meat. And a lot of you felt that I don't eat enough vegetables. Now what I would like to do, I would like to take this opportunity to challenge you today and say, okay, well, uh, why don't you guys design a, des a diet for me? Yeah? And uh, we'll open up a special thread on the discussion forum for you to deposit, to post uh, a diet so a breakfast, lunch, and dinner for me that I will follow for one day. And a number of you will be uh, selected, and I will follow those diets uh, for one or two days, and I'll report the results uh, the week after. And um, there are a few things that you need to take into account. Uh, I won't eat meat, uh, so no fish or, or meat. Uh, but otherwise, I'm, I'm pretty open-minded. Uh, I do want to go to the bathroom uh, once a day, so... Uh, Please take that into account. Uh, but other than that, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very curious what you will uh, come up with. So uh, I would like to challenge you. Please go ahead. Be creative. And uh, perhaps it can be a, a copy of your own diet. Uh, of course, I need to eat enough. Uh, many of you felt that I eat a lot. Uh, but of course, I, uh, I, uh, yeah, I weigh, what is it, 76 kilograms. Um, I'm... I said I wasn't too active, but uh, perhaps I, my energy expenditure is quite a bit more than, uh, than many of you. So uh, we need to take that into account. But uh, we'll see how it goes. If I'm hungry for, for a little bit, that, that won't be too bad either. So please go ahead and uh, we'll get back to it uh, in the next week. I like my veggies, but like this, I don't think I've eaten a raw carrot in, in probably five to ten years. Anyway, I think I'm uh, going to ask for the alternative. Would you please take this back and provide me with something else? Thank you. Okay, that brings us to the topic of resistant starch. Many of you posted questions about resistant starch on the discussion forum and I'll try to answer them um, in today's uh, recap video. Now, the main question is, what is resistant starch? And now, resistant starch is starch that is resistant to digestion by the normal digestive enzymes. Now, normal starch is uh, present in, in a variety of foods, and it's uh, digested by uh, so-called amylase produced by the pancreas, and it breaks it down to glucose, so it can be taken up into our bodies. Now, starch is a polymer that can fold in many different uh, many different ways and if you would take the uh, starch that is present in uh, a raw potato it, it, it is folded in such a way that the digestive enzymes can't gain access to it and therefore it, it leaves the body undigested, it, 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 it leaves the small intestine undigested and enters into the colon where the bacteria can go to town on it and it basically becomes a fiber. Now if you boil a potato and then the starch will unfold and it becomes di accessible to these enzymes. However, if you leave it to cool down again, then the starch refolds in such a way, basically almost back to its original state, uh, where the enzymes again have difficulty uh, gaining access to it. Uh, so resistant starch is found in a variety of foods, uh, unboiled potatoes, potatoes that have been boiled but allowed to cool down, 
to some extent, that's the same is true with pasta. Uh, cookie dough would be a good example of, uh, of a food that is uh, mostly resistant starch. An unripe banana also contains resistant star starch, and there are a few other foods that are like that. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about uh, resistant starch. In the next part, I want to talk about the um, food composition tables. Okay, my next dish, dish arrived. Huh. Uh, hmm. The uh, production team here knows that I'm not particularly fond of sugary foods, and they put a, uh, a special cookie in, in front of me. It's, uh, it's in, uh, it translates into a filled cookie, a gevulde cook. Uh, it's very rich, uh, full of sugar, fat, and I haven't eaten these in, uh, and I'm not kidding, probably 25 years. So uh, I'm afraid I, I have to dig in in, in a few minutes. Uh, but for now, I want to say uh, something about these food composition tables. A lot of you are interested to know about the composition of some of the common foods, and uh, I've provided that inf for information for a limited list uh, in the MOOC. Uh, but if you want to know more information, if you want to uh, look up the composition of specific foods, then I can refer you to a number of resources. There's one in the U.S. that's uh, put out by the USDA, and we'll provide the URL uh, in the MOOC um, uh, very soon, so you will be able to look that up. And basically, you can find the food composition of any food that you can possibly think of. Um, and in, in Europe, there is uh, something equivalent, uh, an organization that's called Eurofur. And that organization all put, also puts out and has an overview of the various food composition tables uh, used throughout Europe. What I would like to say is that these food composition tables provide averages, meaning that uh, we had the discussion about uh, boiled pasta, and some people found boiled pasta con to contain over 30 grams of carbohydrate, whereas according to my estimate and my table, it was more, uh, closer to 20 grams of carbohydrate. And in the case of boiled pasta, it's easy to imagine because the longer you boil it, the, the more water it, it absorbs and the lower the relative carbohydrate content. So these are not absolute numbers, they're averages. The food that you actually uh, eat uh, may differ slightly from those numbers. And that's what makes it so difficult to, to determine our, our dietary intake, uh, because we need to rely on the accuracy of these food composition tables. And uh, every food uh, will differ uh, to some extent from, from these tables based on, on growing conditions, uh, methods of, of preparation, uh, and many other reasons. So please take that into account. Uh, it's not an absolute science. Uh, these are averages that are used uh, for you and are available for you to gain insight into the composition of, of some of the common foods that are part of your diet. Yeah, I really can't eat this. The production is team is playing a trick on me. They, they, they knew that there was, this was going to be a surprise menu, so I really don't know what I'm getting. And, and they served me all this, this, this stuff, which they know I, uh, I would never eat or would be extremely reluctant to eat. So I'm afraid I'm going to have to uh, uh, push this meal aside and ask for the, uh, the third course. Hopefully that will be better, because I don't want to leave uh, hungry. Uh, wait, could you please uh, provide me with the third course? Then, uh, I just can't take this. Um, as you can see, I, uh, I'm not particularly fond of sugar. And that br actually brings us to the, uh, uh, the third topic uh, of today, which is um, the ultimate source of sugars. And some que uh, people had some questions about that. And uh, there was a question, a multiple choice question that asked about, the, uh, that asked about this. And what we... Uh, what was the answer is that ultimately all sugars are originating from plants. And some people thought, oh, well, uh, what about the galactose? That's part of lactose, uh, and that's produced by cows. And, well, even in cows, ultimately, the, the sugars come from what they consume, and that could be grass or corn, but it would be plant material. Uh, now, photosynthesis describes a process where carbon dioxide and water is converted into oxygen and glucose, and it occurs in plants, and if you want to know more about it, you should follow our, our second MOOC, um, Growing Our Future Foods, uh, crops, that is now running as well. Um, but photosynthesis produces glucose in plants, and then, I'll, then we eat those plants, and that's how we acquire uh, glucose and other sugars. 
And what we're able to do is interconvert uh, these sugars. So we can convert glucose into galactose uh, or glucose into fructose or vice versa. Uh, but we cannot synthesize glucose from scratch. That is just not possible and that's why we need, uh, that's why we need plants. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about, uh, about sugars uh, in, and their origin. Uh, there was also a question about the ability to convert sugar into fat and vice versa. And what is very important to realize is that we're able to make fat from sugar. Uh, we have the necessary enzymes and we have the appropriate metabolic pathways to convert sugar into fat. What we cannot do is the other way around. We cannot convert fat, once it is made, into sugar. No? And that's very important uh, to realize and it poses certain limitations on, on how we can deal uh, with, uh, with certain challenges that we're exposed to. For instance, during fasting, during fasting we need to rely on our internal stores, our internal energy stores, and they're mostly in the form of fat. We only have very limited carbohydrate stores, which are qu very quickly exhausted. So that means we need to rely on our fat stores, but we cannot fa convert fat into sugar. Um, even though we do need sugar, uh, many tissues need sugar and they continue to, to require sugar during fasting. So basically what that means are, is that our body starts to break down uh, muscle tissue and other tissues to release amino acids and those amino acids, they can be converted into sugar and uh, subsequently the sugar can be used as an energy source by these tissues such as the brain. You know, so that means initially during fasting you break down a lot of uh, muscle tissue and one way to prevent that is to consume small amounts of carbohydrate uh, in order to provide the glucose that some of these tissues uh, need. Okay, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, I'm uh, still waiting for my, uh, for my last meal. I uh, wonder what that is going to be. Uh, hopefully it is a little bit more appetizing. Oh my God. Uh, I hope you guys see what th these are. These are insects. I don't know if you're aware of the movement where people uh, eat insects uh, as a protein source. Uh, it's actually supposedly a really good protein source. Uh, I'm not so sure about it. I've never eaten these things. And this will be my first time live on camera to eat, uh, I think it's a cricket. It's a dried cricket. Uh, I don't know how you eat them, but I'm just gonna try it out raw. Uh, I hope I'm not gonna throw up, but uh, we'll see. Uh, so watch me. Actually, it's not bad at all. It is crunchy. Slightly, um, it doesn't have a whole lot of taste. Um, texture is not particularly disgusting at all. It has, it's a little bit sugary, but I can eat another one. I mean, it's almost like eating nuts. Um, uh, I hope I don't get sick tomorrow but I'm not sure I'm gonna eat this whole uh, cup, but I may eat a few more. Um, I'll challenge you. I challenge the production team who are watching me and thinking, what is he doing? And uh, we're not gonna go home until everyone here eats one of these. So have a good week and I'll see you next week. Oh, good stuff. <laughs>